بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله um, جزاك الله خير um, to the presenters and organizers and um, to anyone else who is here we begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we praise him and we thank him and we ask for Baraka in a few minutes to talk about his words, um, specifically um, verses number 8 through 11 of uh, Surah Al-Fatih, which is the topic of today's kind of Quranic discussion slash reflection slash tafsir. Um, it's important to go back into the seerah and really get a little bit of context um, to better understand the text. You know, the Quran and seerah are very much like chalk and chalkboard. This is what one of my teachers told me one time. He took some chalk and he wrote something in midair and he said, what did I just write? And no one knew what he wrote. Then he took the chalk and he wrote it on a chalkboard, right? And he said, now what did I write? And the words were very clear. And he said, that chalk is like the Quran and that chalkboard is like the seerah, right? The words never really become clear and apparent and obvious until you have the backdrop. And these uh, ayat are in a very specific and important backdrop of the time in which the Muslims were in Medina. And um, it was around year five, and there was a, um, a battle that had occurred. Um, and you know, there's a lot of ahadith about the Battle of Ahzab and the things that happened afterward. I'm just gonna generally summarize everything. Um, just to give you a better understanding of the background. Um, and, you know, the pagans and the Meccans, they had gathered all these different tribes and clans all around the peninsula to come and annihilate the Muslims once and for all. And um, uh, they failed. Of course, you know the story of the Battle of the Trench, the key point here being a trench that Salman al Farisi, the Persian convert, had the idea to dig around the city, which stopped the uh, pagans from being able to successfully attack they left and after they left the prophet muhammad had a dream and in this dream he had this dream in which he was entering into mecca to perform the sacred pilgrimage now the muslims till that point had not done so and the dreams of the prophet are not like dreams of um your dreams and my dreams the dreams of the prophets um salawatullahu alayhim jamian are like a form of revelation. And so when Ibrahim in the Quran tells his son, Ismail, inni arafi manam anni adbahuk, he doesn't know what to do about this because he saw the dream. And in this dream, it doesn't make sense to him, but he, in this dream, he sees that he's slaughtering his son. And he tells his son, I, what do you think of this? Right? Um, what am I supposed to do? Because this is a command from Allah now. This is a dream I had, but it's actually a command from Allah. So he brings it to his son and says, what would you men do? And his son tells him, oh, father, do as you've been commanded, and I, you will find me patient. And you know the rest of that story. Um, and uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now sees a dream uh, after the Muslims successfully withheld this onslaught at the Battle of Ahzab a few years into their time at Medina, this dream in which he sees now that he is entering into Mecca um, to perform the pilgrimage and he tells his companions and he gathers his companions and he says this is a command from Allah and this is what I'm going to do. So they um, they all get ready to go into pilgrimage even though they're really in no place to do so. They're really, they don't have, um, they're still in a state of war with the Meccans and they're still, you know, uh, quite, um, you know, unstable in the um, society that they formed. They, they, there was just a war and, you know, um, uh, things aren't looking that good. But this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a very, very strong element of tawakkul here. So the Muslims, you know, they they get into their ihram and if you've never been on pilgrimage before, you know, it's just a very simple two-garment clothing, um, sandals, uh, not wearing any perfume, not covering your face, not trimming any of your hair, you know, and you're kind of in this state of uh, sanctity, but also vulnerability, right? And um, the Meccans, they get word that the Muslims are coming and they know they can't attack them if they're within the sacred precincts. 
So they try to stop them on the outskirts, and they finally stop them in a place called Hudaybiyah, right? And in this place of Hudaybiyah, there was a dried out well. It was kind of a stopping place. And um, the uh, Muslims entered into negotiations with the uh, Meccans uh, to be able to enter into the city and perform pilgrimage. Um, now, this was a bit of a problem for the Meccans because if the Muslims did this, it would have kind of looked like they were imposing their will. And it's all about saving face, right? When it comes to the psychological and political kind of components of war, really, it's, it's really about saving face. So they had to do something um, to save face and make it not look like the Muslims could simply impose their will. And the Muslims began to negotiate and, you know, just like any other negotiation, you send the people to negotiate who you feel like have the strongest chance of having influence. So the Muslims sent um, Uthman ibn Affan as one of the people to go in and negotiate terms to let the Muslims uh, make pilgrimage. Now this becomes very important because Uthman gets delayed. But um, uh, in the verses that we're gonna talk about actually have to do with this very specifically. But in a broader general sense, just to give you the backdrop of the story, and then more specifically, we'll go into verses eight through 11, which we'll talk about here in the next few minutes. Essentially what happens is after all of the negotiations and after all of the back and forth, um, the Muslims are turned away. In fact, as the deal goes down in which Rasulullah agrees to, uh, not only would they not be allowed to enter into Mecca and make pilgrimage right there and then, they had to go back to Medina. And so now it looks like the Meccans were imposing their will, right? And any Muslim, anyone who became Muslim from the Meccans, right, uh, had to go back to Mecca. And anyone um, uh, who, um, who were, um, was to go to Mecca and wanted to come back to Medina wasn't able to do so, right? And so it felt very, very unfair. And um, Umar radiallahu anhu, you know, you know, Umar was always one to speak out and, you know, he, as they're riding back with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar, you know, comes up to him and says, you know, you know, uh, uh, didn't you have a dream, right? Aren't we on the haqq? Like, you know, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wouldn't answer him. And even Abu Bakr initially, you know, said some words of uh, amusement and surprise, and none of the Muslims knew what was going on. And as Umar was speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, as they were leaving and going back, right, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa stays quiet. And Omar comes up to him again, he tries talking to him again, and he stays quiet. And Omar gets very, very concerned now because he's like, the Prophet is mad at me. I showed a little bit of emotion, you know, and what if now he's receiving revelation and now Allah is upset with me and Allah is going to reveal something against me. And all of a sudden, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has a smile on his face. And he tells Omar <clears throat> uh, to come and he recites the surah. And in the very beginning of the surah, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Now think about this for a moment. We're going to get into our specific verses here, but think about this for a moment, right? Um, my screen fell off. Can everyone still see me? Oh, okay. I see what you did. You put the ayat. Okay, very good. You put the ayat of Quran here. Allah is saying, we have opened for you a manifest victory. Fatham Mubina, right? Now, the Muslims were coming off of the Battle of Ahzab, in which it looked like a stalemate, and it looked like they were unstable, and at any moment they could have been annihilated. And now, they're coming into Mecca to make pilgrimage, and they're told to go back, and the Muslims... You know, the people who came into Medina and became Muslims had to go back to Mecca, and the ones who went to Mecca don't have to come back to Medina. And what kind of victory is this, right? Uh, and so Rasulullah has this big smile on his face because he just received the Quran. He just received these ayat of Surah Al Fat as they're leaving camp and going back to uh, Medina. And Omar is like, a fatun huwa? This is a victory, right? And what's really beautiful about this, you know, is what it's a victory of, 
you know, like we talk a lot about the idea of being a winner in this design, right? Or, or being successful, right? But what does that actually mean? You know, is that really something tangible? Or is it something that's more a perspective thing? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this may look like from a political science point of view, from a war strategic point of view, right? Or from a very tangible materialistic point of view, this may look like a loss, right? But the way I'm going to show it to you, it's actually a victory, right? It's all about perspective and how you see things. And Iman, faith, is all about seeing things the way they really are, right? Rasulullah used to always make a dua. He used to say, Allahumma arini al Oh Allah, show me things the way they really are. Now, Surah Al-Fatih is about seeing the situation the way it really is, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines victory here as لَيَغْفِرَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكْ وَمَا Forgiveness. All of this, this victory, this is so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive you, right? All of what you're going through right now, all of these hardships, all of these difficulties, you know, the effort in which you go, you come back, and all these different things, all this is, is just a few moments on life so you can earn Allah's forgiveness. And if you've done that, if you've done your best and there are shortcomings here or things didn't work out there or the numbers didn't quite add up here or something, but you did your best, right? Allah is going to forgive you. And that is the ultimate victory, right? And so, you know, there's two words in the Arabic language that often deal with success and victory. One is najah, which is a very materialistic, worldly, tangible word that means victory or success, right? But the other is falah. And falah, it's interesting, the falahin are farmers. And what does the farmer do? The farmer plants a seed, right? But the success of that seed isn't seen till the next season, right? And so when we say falah, we say success, we mean success, but what we mean is that the true success is not seen until the next season, i.e. the afterlife. We plant the seeds here in this life of good deeds and effort, but the real success is seeing the fruits of that manifest in the next life. And that is earned through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah by talking about forgiveness, and he ends the surah by talking about forgiveness, right? Now back into the context of these verses, verses number 8 through 11, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a couple of different things. The role of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The incident in which um, Uthman ibn Affan goes to negotiate and something very, very significant happens there. And then the reaction of the hypocrites in, um, uh, in even making this expedition and going out for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, under uh, under the commandment of of the the prophet uh, seeing this dream in which he was to make um, pilgrimage. So these are the different topics that we're going to cover. In verse number eight, it begins by saying, "Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira." Um, if you want to move the screen to verse number uh, eleven, I'm sorry, verse number eight. Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. It's there on the screen. Indeed. Um, we have sent you as a shahid and a mubashir and a nadir. What's a shahid? A shahid is a witness, right? Now, when, you know, we don't typically use that word in the English language. Like, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm a witness for this purpose or I'm a witness. You know, it has a kind of a legal uh, context or it has a little bit of like a courtroom kind of context to it, you know. Um, and we don't use it that often, but in the Arabic language, Right, it tends to mean seeing something but also experiencing something. Like when we say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Right, there is a admission there, and shahada has to do with that. It has to do with an admission. Right, it's also seeing something and perceiving it, but also experiencing it. Right, and so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is um, he's bearing the message. And he's showing us how to see it. He's showing us how to experience it. 
and that is a proof either for us or against us. That's the idea of shahad, right? It's either a proof for us or uh, or against us, and therefore no one is left with any excuse once the shahada, right? has been implemented. No one is left with any excuse not to believe in Rasulullah So Allah sends him as a shahid. No one has any excuse anymore. And on the day of judgment, he's going to be shahidan alayna, right? He's going to be a witness uh, for us or a witness against us. And nadir and bashir, bashir is someone who bears good news and nadir is someone who bears bad news, right? Or someone who who gives good tidings and someone who warns. And Rasulullah said, of course, his role was to give good tidings at paradise and um, to warn against um, the uh, the hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number nine, And so that you can believe in Allah and his messenger and honor him and respect the Prophet and exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, all day and all afternoon. Let's talk about the Arabic here. So that you can believe, have faith, develop Iman. The whole point of Rasulullah is to teach us who Allah is, his names, his attributes, right? And um, um, and, and to see that and to تخلق um, بأخلاق right? Inculcate those names and attributes into our own character to the best of our um, ability um, and to foster and develop that iman, and that we can believe in his prophet, right? Iman is that you believe in Allah and his prophet. Iman is not simply that you believe in God, right? If someone believes in God and they believe that Muhammad was a liar, right? That's not considered iman. Iman is believing that Rasulullah in every single thing that he brought is true. Every single thing that he brought is true, and he never communicated anything that was not true. That's what iman is, right? That's what true iman is, right? He took me billahi wa rasulihi wa tu'azziruhu wa tu'aqiruhu, right? And that you um, support him, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you give him izza. Izza is support, and it's um, it's also like dignity. Like Allah SWT says in the Quran, Man kana yuridu al-izza, falillahi al-izza tujami. Whoever wants izza, all izza belongs to Allah SWT. It's, izza is power, it's honor, it's dignity. The word aziz comes from that, right? Aziz is one who is powerful, one who is unique, right? And, um, and one who is capable, right? And so to give power and capacity, Right and appreciate the uniqueness of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what it means to give him Izzah. You know the pagans uh, of Mecca. They actually, you probably heard of Uzza, right? And at Tabari in his Tafsir, he mentioned Uzza was simply the god that they created to find a shortcut to Izzah. And this is why Allah says in the Quran, "Man kan yuridu al-Izzah, but Allah al-Izzah to jamia." Whoever wants Izzah, right? This power, this honor, that belongs to Allah. Now Allah is telling us, you have to give that to the Prophet Muhammad You have to help him, you have to aid him, um, and, and you have to give everything you can to um, to support him. To Waqar is like honor and dignity, right? That's something that exists in the heart. It's a love. It's a sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every time you hear his name, right? It's not tolerating um, or never being okay with him being insulted in any way, right? That's what waqar is. Imam Malik, when he would teach hadith, um, it's recorded that he was ta'mal at tib wa sarrah he would put on cologne, he would, he would comb his his beard, you know, he would wear his best clothing. Um, uh, uh, he would sit on the, at the very edge of his carpet. And then وَتَمَكَّنَ بِوَقَارِ He would always make sure that whenever he's teaching, he would never be slouched over. If he's ever saying anything of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he would never be slouched over, right? He would have so much adab in just the way he sits if he's talking about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? وَتَمَكَّنَ uh, بِوَقَارِ uh, to, to, to give him honor, right? He would sit in an honorable way to give the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam honor when he would talk about him. And Allah Subh'ana wa Ta'ala is telling us as Muslims, okay, this is what you do with the Prophet. You help him, you aid him. You support him, you love him, 
you honor him in your words, in your body language, in everything that you do, you raise him to the highest place possible. In the beginning of Surah Hujurat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yadayi lahi wa rasuli. O you who believe, don't put anything ahead of Allah and his message, which includes your nafs, which includes your preferences, which includes your own ideas, right? Don't put any of that ahead of Allah and his messenger. That's what it means to honor him, to love him, to support him as well. And then this is where knowing a little bit of Arabic is very important, right? The pronoun, the next verb or next word that comes here, and to uh, praise him, the him here is not the Prophet Muhammad. This pronoun is referring back now to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to praise Allah, right? Uh, all day, all evening. Bukra is actually the beginning of the day, and the asil is actually the end point of the day. And so this is actually a type of a euphemism in Arabic in which you you mention the end points of something to actually include all of it. Like you might say sharqan wa gharban, right? East and west, because what you really mean is everything in between. And if you say bukra tan wa asilan, you don't just mean beginning of the day and end of the day, you mean the whole day and everything in between, right? And so that's really essentially like in a state of ibadah, being truly in a state of ibadah, you're constantly worshiping, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all throughout the day. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse, we have two more verses. In verse number 10, he talks about now the incident that I had alluded to earlier in regards to Uthman, right? And in the period of negotiations in which Muslims were trying to negotiate their way into um, Hudaybiyah, they had sent Uthman to go and speak to um, the Banu Umayyah because the Banu Umayyah had a lot of clout in Mecca and Uthman was actually from that clan. So of course you send someone from the clan so that they can have a little bit more clout. And because he was from the clan, when he goes into Mecca and he's the only one who goes in, they you know show him a little bit of respect, of course, they probably give him some tea, they sit him down, they talk a little bit, you know, I mean, these are people, these are human beings. Maybe they're talking about cousins and uncles and so on and so forth, and things get delayed. Now, it's a very tense situation, and because it's delayed, a rumor spreads that Uthman has been killed. Now, this is where being a believer, right, and really internalizing the words that, you know, in the mu'minun ikhwan. The believers are brothers of one another, right? You die for your brother. You sacrifice for your brother. In another uh, verse, Allah SWT says, the believing men and the believing women, they protect one another, right? And so being protectors of one another, that means you got each other's back, right? You know how you're really close to someone, right? And if, if something were to ever happen to them, you're like, man, I got your back, right? Now, that's how the Muslims have to be with one another. Like, we have to have each other's back. And Rasulullah, when he hears about this, he gathers all of the Muslims that were there. And it was about 1,400 Muslims in two pieces of cloth with no real weapons. You know, they might have had a little dagger or something on them, which was just a cultural thing. It wasn't really a war weapon, right? In sandals, in the burning heat, right? And all of this, right? They're not in a state to fight, but Rasulullah gathers them. Now, where do you gather? You gather under a tree when you're out in the middle of a desert because the tree is the only place where there's shade. And if you got to stand around, you're going to look for shade, right? And if anyone here has actually been to Mecca and Medina, you know how hot it gets. And you're always looking for shade if you're ever there. <laughs> if you've ever been there for, for Hajj or Umrah, you're always looking for shade somewhere, right? Because it's super, super hot. So there was a tree, right? And they gathered under the tree. And Rasulullah said, I want everyone to pledge right now that they truly have with man's back and that they will, they are prepared to fight to the death and that they're not going to escape. No matter what, they're not going to run, right? And many of the companions said, on that day, we gave a pledge to die. That's essentially what we did, right? We were ready to die for Uthman. And the situation got very tense. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those people who came and gave bayah, like they agreed, like they gave a covenant, 
then the covenant is what we're talking about right now, that they were ready to fight on behalf of Uthman, even though they were in no position to fight and it was essentially like a death sentence, right? Those people who gave you, they shook your hand, they gave you bayah, they gave you that covenant, they agreed. They were really giving a covenant to Allah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is directly connected to Allah in this sense. Anything you do to obey the Prophet, you're doing to obey Allah. Anything you do to disobey the Prophet, you do to disobey Allah, right? And you know, there are people who, you know, there are deviant kind of like groups of Muslims who kind of talk about, well, all you need is the Quran, you don't really need the Sunnah. And this is an extreme, extreme fallacy, which um, is essentially a form of disbelief because uh, how could you disregard the Sunnah when that is simply everything and anything about the Prophet, which is simply everything of what Allah wants you to do, right? There's no separation. You can't separate between um, the Prophet and what God wants you to do, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they really gave bayah to Allah. Yadu Allahi fawqa aydihim. The hand of Allah is upon their hand, is above their hand. There's many kalam about this amongst the ulama, many different opinions. Some say this is metaphorical. Yad here means power. So when you truly devote yourself to upholding, like giving bayah to the Prophet, like really upholding everything the Prophet asked you to do and staying away from everything he asked you to stay away from, there's a power that will be with you, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid you. He will support you because hand metaphorically symbolizes that. And there were many kind of um, uh, verses of poetry that different scholars would allude to to say, look, this is typically how the Arabs would use the term yet. It was used in a metaphorical sense to mean power. Other Muslims said, no, you can't impose that metaphorical idea on the words of Allah. Hand means hand, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hand in a manner befitting his majesty. So these are two different um, opinions that are out there. فَمَنْ نَكَثْ So whoever نَكَثْ نَكَثْ means essentially, uh, you know what نَكَثْ literally means? نَكَثْ literally means to take a like a ball of yarn, and then like you know how there's little strings in a ball of yarn, and then you, you dislodge each string, and essentially like that, that, bond of string, it, be, it becomes loose and falls apart. That's what nakath means, right? Ankatha, like Allah says in the Quran, Ankatha from nakatha, don't be like the one, like the old lady who spins a, a ball of yarn and then it just falls apart, right? Like the idea here is an ishara or an indication that this is like a pact, this is something strong, right? Don't fall back on it and then and then like your aqidah, like the thing that holds you together just kind of falls apart. So whoever does that, they do it to the to their own detriment, right? Essentially is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. If you fall back on your promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do it to your own detriment. And whoever upholds their promise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them a tremendous reward. In the last verse, Allah says, يَقُولُ لَكَ الْمُخَلَّفُونَ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ شَغْلَتْنَا مُوَالُنَا وَأَهْلُونَا فَاسْتَغْفِرُ لَنَا Now, as the Muslims were getting ready to go to Hudaybiyah, it's kind of like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, instead of going forward in the sequence of events, Allah is kind of back, tracking backwards. So there's like a prequel and then a prequel. And so this is now even before, even before they were going out to go on Hudaybiyah, these 1400 Muslims that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had amassed from Medina after he saw this dream, the, the moment he said that he had a dream and that he was commanded to go and make pilgrimage, which is a very hard thing to do and very dangerous because they're essentially in a state of war, immediately there were hypocrites who came and said, oh man, we can't go. We're busy, man. Like we have our ahluna, amwaduna, our wealth, our jobs, essentially. Like I can't get off work, right? Or my family has this, my family, my family, is this. just seek our forgiveness, right? And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They're saying with their tongues what's not really in their hearts. This is essentially the way of hypocrisy, right? Now, this was a very specific event here, but the ulama, they say, where the real lesson is in the generality of the words, it's not just in the specific incident, right? I mean, 
it's a tendency, right? And this tendency is something we have to look for within ourselves. How quick are we to look for excuses to stay within our comfort zone? That's the question to ask. Like, how quick are you to find an excuse, right? Here, it's like work, wealth, family, right? How quick are you to find an excuse? I don't, you know, I don't feel well, or I just can't get off of work, right? Or, yeah, I have this thing with my family, I have this thing with my family, I can't, I can't help out with a fundraiser, I can't donate, I can't do this, I can't do that. Whenever, whenever the cause of Allah, right, is being raised in the community, Boom, I come to an excuse in my mind of how to get out of it. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Look for four things within yourself. Because if whoever has these four things is a true hypocrite, right? Right? And whoever has one of these, has one of the characteristics of hypocrisy until he leaves it, right? And so what are these four things? The hypocrites, either hadath um, uh, whenever he talks, he lies, right? This is one tendency of hypocrisy, is to just say something, just to get someone off your back, right? Just to get out of the situation. Whatever you have to say to get out of a situation, even if it's a lie, you'll say, or to get the better hand or to get the upper hand, even if that's to say you'll lie, right? And if we, and when that person makes a promise, أخلفها, they break their promise, right? Sort of like, yeah, you know, I'll be there, or I'll help out, or I'll come, or I'll be a part of this event, or I'll do this, or I'll do that, or you know, I'll donate and I'll I'll contribute and I'll you know I'll do you know this that this that, but they don't really follow up. Their words don't mean anything, right? They get the credit for simply saying it, but they don't really follow up, right? They don't want to get out of their comfort zone. وَإِذَا خَاصَمَا Characteristic number three, the خَاصَمَا فَجَرْ And then when they get into a dispute, they erupt. They're, they don't have self-control, right? And in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ A characteristic of the hypocrites, right? They think that, you know, every single accusation is against them, right? They're so insecure. That's really about insecurity. Hypocrisy and insecurity are really, really linked, right? And so because they're so insecure, they have to act out, right? And so that's essentially what the hadith is saying. Characteristic number three is they're always acting out, right? And whenever they make a covenant, and this is what the verse here is talking about, they break their covenant, right? They don't see sacredness and value and importance in keeping your word and keeping your covenant, right? So, um, there's a like there's a theme here like there's a common tendency and that's like let me just do whatever I need to do say whatever I need to say to be fair weather to get the upper hand to stay in my comfort zone to avoid difficult situations right and I'll I'll dress the dress I'll put on the garb I'll talk the talk right but in the end when it comes to action right this is this is what you see as the quality of of the hypocrites. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is just stuff that they're saying, right? But that's not what's really in their hearts. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, because Allah doesn't, He doesn't, He doesn't, He's above addressing their words. All He does is addresses the tendency that we're talking about, right? But tell me, who could withhold, right? from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything, if he wanted good for you or he wanted bad for you, right? Because the tendency here is, oh, we're not gonna go out with the Muslims because we're worried that they're gonna get killed. But what if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to be, wanted you to die in your own homes, right? Wanted you to die when you walked out in the street. You can't escape qada, right? And so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you, there's nothing that can withhold it. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants bad for you, right, there's nothing that can withhold that. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over everything, um, all aware, right? And so these verses are kind of um, verses number 8 through 11. They're in the thick and um, thin of the surah um, in a very, very intense moment within the surah. Um, and um, essentially, um, uh, the, the the climax of of the surah 
the beginning, the end. I, I encourage everyone to read the whole surah and get you know the whole picture and really immerse yourself in the sirah part of it. Because there's so many lessons and there's so many gems. Um, but these uh, three or four verses themselves also have uh, plenty. So we'll stop here and we'll see if anyone has any questions or comments. So inshallah, the first question, we, we talked about the allegiance to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam within these verses. If we think about how these verses are supposed to impact us today, what does allegiance to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mean for us today? That's a very good question. I think you could approach this question in um, numerous different ways. And one of the first thing that kind of comes to mind is principles, right? And, and, and values. But Rasulullah Sallam, he taught us principles. He taught us uh, values. And, um, and he also taught us jurisprudence, permissibility, things that are halal and things that are haram. There are a lot of things that compete with that nowadays in modernity, right? There are a lot of uh, quote unquote modern day values that compete with the values that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi taught us, right? Modern day um, uh, permissibilities and impermissibility, things you should do or things you shouldn't do, or things that are encouraged or not encouraged, that compete with those ideas of what he taught is halal and haram. When you talk about a covenant with the Prophet, you know, your hand is there with the Prophet and you're making a covenant with the Prophet and Yadullahi Fawqa Aideen, Allah's hand is above all of that, right? That covenant really means that whatever the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu made haram, nothing in today's time can make that halal. No amount of pressure, no amount of political lobbying, right? No amount of uh, uh, like um, linguistic malleability, Right, taking words and kind of making them like plastic and shipping, sh sh shaping them to whatever meaning you want them to have, right? No amount of societal pressure can change that haram to halal and vice versa, right? That's loyalty to the Prophet, right? The values that he taught us, the principles that he taught us, right? Also putting all of that above our own preferences. That's today, that's, that's, um, Bayah to the Prophet, right? That's really that's really the covenant to the Prophet. This is why Allah SWT says in the beginning of Surah Hujurat, right? Don't put anything above the Prophet, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet. That includes your own whims, your own desires, your own passions, your own opinions. Those have to come in line with the divine guidance, right? Um, and to arrogate to yourself the idea that you know better, for example, is to break that covenant. That's to break that covenant, right? Or to take someone else's idea of right and wrong and to take that and try to supersede what the Prophet Muhammad said was really ma'ruf and munkar, what is really good and bad, that's to break the covenant with the Prophet Muhammad and it takes a little bit of reflection, right? It also takes a little bit of knowledge because you have to know what he taught in order to in order to have that. And this is why knowledge is so important, right? Basic kind of education in sirah, very very basic education in fiqh, right? Um, you have to know that in order to truly fulfill that covenant with him. Is that like her? Um, along similar lines. Um, what may be some common examples of how Muslims may be disobeying Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam today? At least if we are aware of some of the common pitfalls uh, that Muslims may be prey to, we can try and stay away from them. Uh, what would be you know, some examples of where we may be disobeying Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not even knowing it, that we should be aware of? Well. Um... I think that, again, I mean, specifically, everyone kind of has their own ex experience and struggles and difficulty with that, you know, and um, we, I mean, we live in a, in a society where, I mean, we're, it's like the hadith, like holding on to faith in today's time is holding, it's like holding on to a hot coal. And I don't want to give the illusion, right, that, um, 
we're all just kind of treacherous or something like that. You know, the idea is just to do, you have to do your best, right? And this is why istighfar is so important. I'm going to get to the question here in a second, but this is why istighfar is such a big part of our deen, like constantly asking Allah for forgiveness because we were created weak. Right? Mankind was created weak. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom, he did that so that we would constantly come up short and then turn to him. And this this is what tilbah is. Toba, the word taba yatubu is to stop and turn, right? And to stop and turn to Allah and humble yourself. That's the whole purpose of life, right? And so, yeah, there may be incidents in which we come up short. Um, just keep in mind, that's okay, right? Um, uh, the whole purpose of life, the whole pur- the whole idea of success, like we mentioned in the surah, is forgiveness. And that's constantly returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking his aid and guidance and, um, and forgiveness. But what are some, co- what are some common um, examples? Some common examples might be like, you know, um, um, in the realm of um, definitions of society of what is really good or what is really um, or what is really bad. Like, for example, as Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught that marriage is something sacrosanct between a man and a woman only, okay? And there's no other definition um, of where that is okay or good or, or anything like that. And to begin to validate, right, or affirm or confirm any other manifestation of that, that's breaking a covenant with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For an example, right, um, uh, doing something simple that is, you know, simply haram uh, is breaking a covenant with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, not doing something that is wajib is breaking a covenant with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad he says, "Ma amartukum bihi, fatu minhu, mastatatum." This is what he says. Whatever I've told you to avoid, avoid it completely. And whatever I've told you to do, do it to the best of your ability, right? So, inal halal bayin wa inal haram bayin, right? Whatever is halal is clear. Whatever is haram um, is uh, is clear. So, you know, dietary things consuming things with your eyes, watching things that are haram on TV, on the computer, things that you know you shouldn't be watching, right? Um, putting things into your eyes that you shouldn't be, putting things into your ears, right, that you shouldn't be putting into your ears. Most of what's on the radio nowadays, like when it comes to music, 99.9% of what's on there is very harmful to your soul, right? Think about that. Like, is that really what you want to be putting into your ears? Because that's a doorway into your heart, right? Lying, saying things with your tongue that you shouldn't be saying, right? Um, um, and um, backbiting or just useless talk, right? Senseless talk. Uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad warned against that. Oh, man, can I yuk minu billahi wa liyomir akhir? Fali yakul khayran aw yasmut, right? Whoever believes in Allah in the day of the day, let him say what's good or just be quiet, right? So going against that is breaking your covenant with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Walking towards something you shouldn't walk towards is using your feet in a way you shouldn't use them. That's breaking your covenant with Rasulullah And you can go on and on. And there's no sin that is too small to be considered insignificant. In fact, there's a, there's a principle in this, the usul of spirituality, if you will, that says, istisqaru dhunub kabira, to deem any sin even if it's a small sin, as insignificant is a major sin. And this is why Bilal used to say, radiallahu anhu, don't look at the smallness of the sin you commit, but look at the greatness of the one you committed against. Right? That it's a perspective thing. So, um, you know, the examples are numerous. The effects of sins on our hearts are tremendous. And living your life the best you can and avoiding haram and fulfilling the wajib and doing what is halal. That's that's upholding the covenant with Rasulullah. Yeah, sorry. Can you recommend a basic Sirah book for teenagers? Uh, a book, a Sirah book for teenagers? Um, you know, 
one really good book is in the footsteps of the prophet um by um by Tariq ramadan um hamza yusuf has a good audio lecture series on that um revelation is actually a really good um sirah book miraj muhiddin um, who's a physician who wrote it um it's, it's a little bit more recent um and it's called revelation um, the reason that's a it's a good book for teenagers is that um, it has a lot of graphs in it. It has a lot of color diagrams. It has a lot of maps. It's a very visually oriented um, kind of like a learning experience. And so it's not dry with small words and you know kind of um, um, no pictures or anything like that. It's actually a very colorful and dynamic book. Um, Revelation. I, I would definitely recommend that. JazakAllah okay. So inshallah, this will be the last question. Can you provide some advice for the participants today? What should they go away and implement if they have the intention to try and love Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more, to pledge greater allegiance to him? What should we go away and do and implement in our lives daily? I would say a couple of things. One, something that's very, very practical, but very important and very potent, right? Practical, important, and potent. Um, uh, and very palpable as well, like just for your, just in terms of what you feel, is to send salawat on the Prophet every day. Um, you know, um, the, the hadith, is that when you do this one time, 10 times the blessing of that comes back on you, right? And it's also a means of acquiring sakina, which is tranquility and um, serenity. Because Allah SWT says in the Quran, He tells the Prophet, your prayer for the believers is a sakina, it's a form of tranquility for them. Well, when we send prayers upon the Prophet, 10 times that comes back on us. So that's 10 times the serenity, 10 times the um, tranquility. Um, and that has a very important calming effect on our souls, which is something that I think all of us need. You know, I say Xanax is the number one psychiatric drug in America. And it's um, it's a Sakina drug. It's a, um, it's a tranquility drug. It just calms you down, right? Because anxiety is such a big problem. So um, one thing I would definitely suggest is is having a daily regimen, if you don't do it now, but just a daily regimen of sending salawat on the Prophet. And you can do that by simply saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Wa Allah, uh, send your peace and blessing on the Prophet and on the family of the Prophet. Do that a hundred times a day. That's very easy. You know, you think about that. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. How long did that take? Maybe two seconds. So you're talking, two to three hundred seconds a day. You can spare two to three hundred seconds a day um, for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Um, the other thing I would suggest is uh, you can't love someone without knowing them. And um, therefore, in your communities, in your groups, amongst your friends, um, if you're an Arabic speaker and you can read Arabic, you know, all the better because there are tons of Arabic sources. But even if you can only read English, there are plenty of English Sira book sources out there. You know, agree upon a book, get together with your friends once a week, talk about the Prophet. Talk about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Come, you know, purify your intention, come together, you know, every day, take a part of the Sira, talk about it, reflect on it, see how it's applicable to your life, and, you know, make it meaningful and you'll remember it. Don't turn it into an assignment. Don't turn it into a duty. Don't turn it into some kind of like, you know, uh, burden upon yourselves. Do it when you can, but just be persistent. That's the principle. To do something a little bit, but to do it persistently is better to do something a lot, but to do it sporadically, right? So number one, a daily regimen of salawat on the Prophet. Number two, uh, get together with your friends, family, come together, form weekly sirah halaqas, right? 
And um, it doesn't have to be intense. You don't have to be a scholar, but agree on a book. And um, if you have someone there who's a person of knowledge who can help, you know, all the better. But if you don't, it's not an excuse not to, right? And number three, you know, um, um, the you know the ulama of our dean painstakingly, painstakingly developed a whole science of textual criticism to um, determine with the utmost accuracy what this amazing, incredible man, what he said, what he did, what was done in front of him, and he approved, right? His um, his words, his his kalam, his actions, and his taqrirat, the things that he tacitly approved. That's called the sunnah. And they painstakingly um, compiled this into what is known to be authentic, right? Um, and this has been summarized in books like Riyadh al-Salihin, um, books of Hadith, or Imam Nawawi's 40 Hadith, um, which is a summary of that, summary of a summary of uh, Imam Bukhari's uh, book of Hadith. You know, get together again once a week and try to get through one of these uh, comprehensive summarized books of Hadith. These are the words of the Prophet. This is what he said. This is what he did. This is what was done in front of him and he improved, right? Uh, if you truly love him and you want to be close to him, it, you have to know what he said. And you have to do what he said. And you have to put that above your own preferences and above your own whims and desires, right? So that takes a little bit of knowledge, right? So in addition to that chalkboard we talked about earlier, the sirah, you also need his direct uh, advice his direct teachings, his direct words, his direct commandments, his direct prohibitions. These are the hadith. Um, and, um, you know, starting with something as, simply, as, as simple as Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith or Riyadh al-Salihin or something like that, I think, um, is uh, very helpful. So those three things. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiraku wa atubu alayk. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والأسر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سلام الله عليكم سلام الله أكبر